Let's go over some of the conditions or syndromes associated with the muscular system. Many of these are going to be specific to muscles or groups of muscles with clinical significance. This is Procerus, and Procerus is a small muscle which is located superficial to the glabella, superior to the nasal bone. And why do we care? Because for those of us who want to get Botox, get rid of those two little lines that emerge in the forehead, get Botox in glabella. I mentioned torticollis or wry neck when we talked about the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So tortoise is Latin for twisted, collis for collar or neck. So you have a twisted neck when you have torticollis. I had this and my head was sort of in this weird rotated, tilted position for a couple of hours until I got a massage therapist of mine, friend of mine to work it out. It is congenital in babies and in adults it's most commonly due to what, one of the ones that's listed there. So you're sleeping in a weird position. You have some sort of injury that has caused muscle atrophy or scarring to the muscle. It might be associated with a cervical injury that was caused during childbirth or it may just be a muscle spasm. Mine was idiopathic. I just assumed it was a muscle spasm. Only hit it once. And this shows you some of the different angles at which people might have their heads positioned in right neck. Rotator cuff injuries. We did talk about the rotator cuff. Let's do a quickie review. They are going to be both synergists and fixators. They all originate on the scapula. We know that they're going to reinforce the shoulder joint and they help prevent dislocation. Those are the ones that you need to know. And we listed a couple of synergists also. You've seen this image when we talked about the rotator cuff muscles. So what causes it? It's more common with age due to repetitive stress or repetitive use. So it is a repetitive stress injury. If you have this or you know someone who have, they have pain in the shoulder area, it's your, their arms are, their arm is weak, they have reduced range of motion, actually may be a very dull ache in the shoulder region, especially around the acromial process. Painful when you're sleeping, especially when you're lying on that side. And how they treat it is going to depend upon the severity of the damage that happened. If you have a complete tear, they are going to probably try to repair it surgically. If it's a minimal tear, they will probably give you a regime of rest. And after it heals, either if you've had surgery or you are trying to treat it conservatively with rest, you will probably need PT. Carpal tunnel, we mentioned carpal tunnel, and here's more. Watch that video done by the Institute of Human Anatomy. You can actually see the carpal tunnel on a cadaver. It's uh, pretty fascinating. We've already talked about the boundaries, which would be the carpals, as well as the flexor retinaculum that is associated with the carpals. We know that there are gonna be nine tendons and the median nerve that travel through the carpal tunnel. And there you have it, here you can see the median nerve. It is the most common neuropathy. And this is another injury that is associated with repetitive stress or, or repetitive use. Numbness, pain, tingling along the distribution of the median nerve is often worse in the morning. You may have pain that is radiating up the forearm into the antebrachial area. How do you treat it? Overnight splinting, with your wrist and dorsiflexion. If it's really bad, you might consider 
decompression surgery, but make sure that you are correctly diagnosed with carpal tunnel because as we know, it can be associated with something else. This shows you the area of the hand that will be affected if you have carpal tunnel syndrome. You can see the, it's gonna be the lateral aspect of the hand and both anterior and partially posterior too. If it's bad enough, you can see that there is going to be thenar muscle wasting. That's the thenar area is the area that is just proximal to your thumb. There's a lot of muscles there, and if they are not innervated correctly, they will waste. And this is why you want to make sure that you are correctly diagnosed if you think you have carpal tunnel syndrome, because you might actually have TOS, thoracic outlet syndrome. And I know we talked about this when we talked about the scalenes. It is compression of the brachial plexus at the thoracic outlet. So what's the brachial plexus? It's this network of nerves that arise from nerve roots leaving the spinal cord in the cervical area. We know that the scalene muscles are the ones that might be hypertonic. Let me repeat that. The scalenes might be hypertonic and therefore impinging upon the brachial plexus on that side. This shows you where there are actually multiple areas where you could potentially have compression, one at the thoracic outlet, one just deep to the scapula, and another shown there also. So again, if you have carpal tunnel syndrome, make sure you actually have carpal tunnel syndrome. And it's not just that you have carpal tunnel-like symptoms. More of the same. The other reason that you might have Carpal tunnel-like symptoms is because of a cervical verticulopathy. And what does that mean? Basically, it means you have a herniated disc that is affecting or impinging upon one of the nerves that is going to give rise to the median nerve. So the nerve root or one of the major nerves that gives rise to the median nerve actually might be impinged. So there you go. Now you know three things that might cause carpal tunnel-like symptoms if you see it on an assessment. One actual carpal tunnel syndrome, two, thoracic outlet syndrome, three, cervical radiculopathy. And you can say herniated disc in the cervical area if you see that on an assessment. That's a great little video, you can watch that. Now, piriformis syndrome, that's another one we talked about. This is also an entrapment syndrome. We know the piriformis is going to laterally or externally rotate the femur. It is deep to the gluteals. The sciatic nerve is the largest and longest nerve in the body. It is going to supply the posterior aspect of your lower extremity. In piriformis syndrome, the piriformis muscle becomes hypertonic and actually impinges upon the sciatic nerve. And to confound things, in 10 to 15% of the population, the sciatic nerve actually goes through, pierces, transects the piriformis muscle. So if you have any hypertonicity or chronic shortness in that muscle, you're going to have pain down the distribution of the sciatic nerve. There you have it. You can see that the sciatic nerve will branch just superior to the popliteal area and divide into two different nerves. And you might have problems anywhere along that distribution. Actually, multiple different nerves, two different major nerves, I should say. Let me correct myself there. So the two things that can cause pain down the distribution of the sciatic nerve are one, a herniated lumbar disc, or two, piriformis syndrome, in case you see that on an assessment.
if you are pregnant, you might have problems with piriformis syndrome because of the fact that your center of gravity has changed and you actually might have impingement on the sciatic nerve due to a developing fetus. ITB, iliotibial band. We'll remember that that is a major lateral stabilizer of the knee. This is the bane of runners. If you've had this, it can be really painful and it can also be really hard to manage or fix. The leotibial band will originate on tensor fascia lata and gluteus maximus. It's going to insert on the lateral aspect of the tibia, Gertie's tubercle, if you have this crazy need to know. It stabilizes the hip and the knee. And kind of cool, it has the capacity to store elastic energy for running. So when you're running, when you have that lovely bouncy spring to your step, in part, it is becoming, it is coming from the iliotibial band. Totally cool. With iliotibial band syndrome, you have inflammation, which causes either the hip area or the lateral aspect of the knee to be painful. That is repetitive use injury also. Myasthenia gravis. This is actually a serious systemic chronic autoimmune issue. It's going to affect skeletal muscles, including those that are associated with respiration. Two major muscles of respiration are diaphragm and external intercostal muscles. So what happens? We know that it's an autoimmune disease. Your body stops recognizing self and it's actually associated with damage at the neuromuscular junction. The antibodies in your body stop recognizing your synaptic cleft area and will damage or change or destroy acetylcholine receptors on the motor implant. Most common in women under 30 and men over 50, but it can hit anybody. These are some of the symptoms and it's really quite unpleasant because you may lose your ability to see clearly. You may lose your ability to control your facial expressions. You might have difficulty swallowing. You may have shortness of breath and, having diff diff and have difficulty breathing. Or you may have or lose the ability to speak clearly. You also may be weak in your extremities. 